Hi, my name is Halima Tuhima. I'm currently a student uh, doing a master's in public policy at Harvard University. Uh, where do you come from? What are you doing back home? Oh. Or what have you come? What have you done before you left for Harvard? I am from Niger, which is in West Africa. And prior to going to university in the U.S., taking it a while back, I used to. I was the president of the youth parliament of my country, and as president of the youth parliament, we organized various campaigns on girls' education. Went on to, to talk with the communities, had um, work with the government, some certain certain ministries within the government, to have them to have us look at the, pro the programs that they have for youth, made recommendations, but also followed up on some of the recommendations that we made. And for example, one of them was to make sure that the children that were in prisons were separated from adults because before the, the system put them all together. So as a result of the lobby, in fact, we have now a juvenile, juvenile prisons in all facilities. And uh, the work that we did on girls' education was also very dear to me because I was also then a teenager, 15 years old. And a lot of the girls that had to leave school, uh, sometimes not because they want to leave school, but because there are so many other challenges that they face, were in the same. I, I felt I felt strong connection to to these girls, and so did many of the parliamentarians. So we did extensive work on that, and uh, it was after my work with the youth parliament, and I, I still managed to stay top of my class in school. I got a scholarship to go to a school called the United World College, which is a fantastic, uh, fantastic program that brings together students from all over the world. We were 200 students and 90 countries represented. And my school was in New Mexico, in the middle of nowhere and on purpose, so that we really get to mingle. There's so much to learn from each other. And it was really there at the UWC that my my yearning to give back to, to my community grew even bigger. I felt that I was, the, I was an ambassador for my country there and that there's much more that I could do to, to push um, for, for things that I care about in my own communities. Yeah, you were talking about the challenges young girls, young women, teenagers are facing in, in your home country. What, what are these challenges? There are many, like you said, uh, particularly in rural areas. Um, child marriage is a big problem in um, mostly rural areas where statistics say that two out of three girls are married by the age of 15, which is huge. And the repercussions of such practices is that we end up with entire generations of women that haven't gone too far in school and think of what effect that would have on the society and and also another challenge is the fact that schools might be available in certain areas but because of uh, barriers again or the parents not willing to to let their daughters go away from school because not all villages have secondary schools and also fees or costs and direct costs associated with schools parents would rather keep their daughters at home and mothers also would tell you that well they just have other agendas for their for their daughters so you were talking about this youth parliament what does it mean and how is it somehow you know implemented in the entire governance system is it it's independent it's it's an independent structure that every two years first um, selects the top students it's based on merit selects the top students in each region and it's the in in the the parliament for adults then we had 83 people and for the parliament of children we also had 83 parliamentaries so that is it's made at the image of the older parliament the old people's parliament well adults adult people's parliament and the aim of it really is to initiate young people to civic participation early on because oftentimes we think of young people as just people who are there always on the receiving end. Whereas when we start early, young people can be a powerful 
force from change. And in fact, if we look at history, much of the change that has happened in the world has been sustained by the youth. We have time, we are strong, and we are determined. And I think that is something that you see in the youth parliament, really young people committed who go back to their communities and try to give back. So this youth parliament then comes up with proposals for... For the government. For the government. And how do you deal with this? Or how does the government deal with it? Sometimes they put them in drawers and close them. That happens. But other times they listen. Sometimes they listen. And what makes a difference open time is how much lobby sometimes this has been made by the parliament or really how much the minister itself cares, himself or herself cares about the issue. Okay. So, and how is your work appreciated in the rural areas? I can imagine you are facing a lot of challenges there, huh? Back then, yes. And that was, let me um, add that, that was a few years back. I was 15 and today has been 11 years ago. I did a lot of work. After that, that had to do with working with communities. And I must say that when I was then with the youth parliament, some of the resistance we faced had to do with the way we approached the work. That we weren't... When, you, when we come into a community and assume that we know what is right for that community, or assume that we already know what problems they are facing, then we are already... We've really started on the wrong step. Whereas when you go into the community and listen first, ask them what, what are the challenges that you are facing as a community? What do you think are your needs? And then start from that basis and make them an integral part of the process. Then certainly you'd have much less resistance because whatever it is that you end up doing would have come from the community itself. Mm -hmm. So yes, some resistance, um, but oftentimes with concerted efforts, discussions, some resistance might still be there, but people are, are moving at least. So what are you planning to do in Harvard? And are you planning to come back? So after the parliament, I went to the United World College School, which is in New Mexico. After that, I uh, did four years for my undergraduate at Wellesley College, which was also an entire chapter or shall I say even book in my in my life and then went back to Niger where I had the opportunity to work for two years uh, at UNICEF so really whatever I am for me the goal is to learn as much as possible about innovations social innovations that are happening in the world that are changing the face of how people live and and be able to translate some of that into tangible solutions in my country, of course taking into account my own context. Because I must say that although there's not much being said about it, there is a lot happening in Niger and a lot in positive terms as well. We don't get to hear much about that side of the story. But my goal um, after Harvard, which I finish hopefully next year, is to gain some experience working outside of my country and eventually go back. But as I work outside, I've never really been completely disconnected from my home country. I've always tried going back whatever I could because I knew from the moment I ended BWC that I had want, I would want to be involved there. Because it's a place that I understand. I And if there's any, I don't think there's any other place that, that, that needs me as much as my country does, I, I think. So it's important if, if my country is to, de to, be, to, to get developed and the continent as well, it has to be done by the youth. It has to be done by, pe by people who, who see a different future. And I see a different future for, for my country. How would you describe this different future and the positive changes you've mentioned earlier which are happening mm -hmm. in, in Nigeria? Uh, what are they? Um, there are many examples. I can think Give of us many. some, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's, for example, a, a village in one of the regions that had that was been that has been able to boost its agricultural production by using 
innovation that they themselves created, which consisted of planting um, baobab trees at certain distance in the in the farm, and and again this has shown to to give its the soil back its fertility. Now this is real innovation, and I think there has been some more research being done. There's been a lot of uh, scientists, both from Niger and outside, writing in that innovation, which I think is great. But we don't get to hear too much about it. And there are also many entrepreneurs, like female entrepreneurs, that have started very small, but that today are running multi-million, say, five million uh, enterprises. Now that is also something happening and the big change that I see in communities is the fact that increasingly parents are willing to send their children to school and are willing to maintain their children in school including girls as long as the environment is conducive to doing so. So there is that change of mind that, that we see but there's also change in the overall sphere but, all, but despite all these changes challenges also remain. Okay. On several fronts. Uh, what is your connection here to Melton Foundation? <laughs> it's really funny, but um, one of the Melton Fellows, Marisa Scott, is currently the head of the American Cultural Center in Niger. So she talked to um, she talked to the the executive director of the Melton Foundation about me, apparently and sent a few documents and some videos that I did because I did a TED talk, a TED exchange talk earlier in April and apparently Melton Foundation was impressed and they liked it um, and they wanted me to share about some of the work that I did, some of the experiences that I've had both in my own country and outside of it and that's really how it started. It was There was a bridge, somebody linking them to me and it started that way. They invited me, I said, why not? <laughs> so what is your biggest takeaway so far from your days in India? Um, uh, there are many, that's why I'm thinking. It's not because there's none. <laughs> yeah, a few. So give us a few. <laughs> uh, so yesterday I... I, no, the day before, I sat with a group of uh, young people from Chile and all of us really had something we wanted to contribute to. Many of us in the group had too many things we wanted to contribute to. So one thought that definitely for me emerged as a result of these discussions is the fact that if you have too many dreams, to focus on one and to chase it like it's the only one. To really be able to have that type of large scale impact, to focus on that one thing. That is something that I've taken away from being here. And uh, another big takeaway is the fact that the, the yearning for positive change is really uni is a universal language that can bring that has brought people from all over the world here and each one of us hopefully will go back to their own communities or countries and try to continue in that direction there's really there's power in in being in a network